Good evening students. So, today we are going to take up the poem Goblin Market by Christina G. Rossetti. Now, before going deep into the poem, we will understand about Rossetti's ideas about marriage and women. So, there is an observation that has been made by Rossetti or while reading the poem Goblin Market, uh, you are going to get a kind of a image or let us say a kind of an observation in a different or in, a, in an indirect way by Rossetti that women should remain pure until marriage. When you view this quote or let us say this observation of Rossetti, you feel that what Rossetti is trying to do is to endorse the lack of sexual freedom to women. Now that comes as a surprise to us because uh, Krishna G. Rossetti belongs to the Flushley school of poetry or in a way you call it as pre-Raphaelite brotherhood and pre-Raphaelite brotherhood or pre-Raphaelite poetry is mostly known for its visual and also sensual representation. So, it is a kind of a, there is a, there exists a kind of a dichotomy or let us say there is a kind of a contradictory statement to come from a poet like Christina G. Rossetti. And that is the reason why uh, most of, when you look at his, her biography or let us say her observations, it is most, most of the views are more complicated especially with regard to female suffrage and equality. So, at times she does use the biblical idea of women's subordination to man as a reason for maintaining the status quo, while at some other time she also argued for female representation in the parliament and spoke out against the sexual exploitation of women in prostitution. Especially the last line that is uh, the <coughs> female representation and the speaking, speaking out against the sexual exploitation of women is in, in prostitution especially is important when we learn when we study the poem Goblin Market. So, based on this slide you will come to this conclusion that Christina G. Rossetti has a kind of a, a completely contradictory personality when it comes to uh, the case of women, marriage, sexuality etc. So, moving on, what is the background to the poem Goblin Market? So, it was written in 1859 while Rossetti or let us say Christina was volunteering at a cathedral or uh, sorry actually it is a penitentiary for fallen women in the Highgate. Fallen women uh, is a different or let us say it is a good word for uh, prostitutes since prostitution itself is a derogatory word. So, St. Mary Magdalene Penitentiary is the, is the place where she had done the volunteer, volunteering and she had come across a plethora or let us say series of women or this fallen women uh, who had come to the penitentiary uh, to revoke their life, to, to reframe their life and that is what in a different way Rossetti does through the poem too. So, it is an St. Mary Magdalene Penitentiary is an Anglo-Catholic institution and is remarkable in the period for its conviction that women who had transgressed sexually could be redeemed or brought back to life and dedicated to reform and rehabilitation of these prostitutes. So, it is a very good uh, you know gesture from the, uh, from the, from the phase of St. Mary Magdalene to do that. And while working as a volunteer, she found it necessary that this particular theme should be done or should be written in the most pre-Raphaelite brotherhood style uh, as poetry. And there you have the poem, uh, Chris, sorry, uh, Goblin Market. So, the poem when you read it, it has 31 stanzas and obviously it is a lengthier poem, it is not an epic but still it is 31 stanzas. So, it is experimental in its form and compelling in its narrative what it is like seeing a horror movie or let us say what is going to happen. So, it is more moving animated by a surprising lyric energy. You have pathos, you have surprises, you have a horrifying experience. So, it is all these components are brought together to form this poem. And at the same time, it never conforms to a set rhyme scheme or a kind of a metrical pattern. So, these are the, when it comes to structure, this is what makes the poem, poem uh, <coughs> Goblin Market by Christina G. Rossetti. So, moving on, what is the poem all about? So, you have 
two sisters the elder <coughs> the uh, younger one laura and the elder one lizzie lizzie is the elder one and laura is the younger one and their adventures especially their encounter with goblin merchants now who are these goblin merchants we will look uh, into the word in detail in the next slide so before that we will go on to what happens in the poem so <clears throat> you have certain goblin merchants so goblin merchants these goblin merchants they just like you know wayside venters or you know you might have seen a lot of uh, venters uh, mobile venters you know uh, who carries uh, bombay mutai and you know uh, sweets candies etc uh, while they take ee vandi nanu nammala malayalathi pariya you know undu vandil kondu poguna mutai adu pole ne clothes idineke adhe pole you have these merchants you know they these merchants are calling and crying out so that they could sell their fruits so obviously in any old poem the merchants or the people or wayside vendors who are asking for attention uh, you know you the poet at the same time the onlooker or the audience or the readers who read the poem feel a kind of a sympathy towards the person who is selling the fruit because obviously he has to get the money but now here it's not just merchants it's goblin merchants goblins are in a different way they are dwarfs dwarfs so uh, here so they are dwarfs they are magical i think i think we'll look on to who are goblins in the next slide so uh, we'll just skip it for the for the timing so these goblin men they are trying to attract their customers to buy these fruits and you have a a series of fruits a list of fruits with you know enormous fascinating adjectives you know earlier in the 80s and 90s when uh, the malayalam film aniyathi prabha came in there were you know 90s you know the one that women wear at night uh, there was a brand called aniyathi prabha 90s you know uh, so that uh, it's an adjective that has been fixed to the 90s you know the style and the way it is uh, framed so here also you have a different kind of an adjective a lot of adjectives are there pine apples blackberries lemons oranges cherries melons raspberries strawberries uh, so a lot of other adjectives has also been added on to these cherries and melons whenever these are repeated again in the poem so here in the in the first half itself the peaches are compared amusingly to cheeks bloom down cheeked peaches that's the exact word which is used that is the adjective bloom down cheeked peaches you know so the fruits these fruits which are of great variety are inherently magical unusual or exotic in nature and represent going against the norm you know going against the norm that's what it is and you have to understand the biblical references to uh, the story of the the story of adam and eve where adam sorry eve consumes the forbidden fruit so this these fruits marks or it's a kind of a symbol of the forbidden fruit and that's the reason why it is considered to be magical unusual exotic in reach, nature and something which goes against the norm which again marks the importance of the forbidden fruit and it's mundane and it's also seasonal and so also suggests that the tempting nature of not only the goblins but also the fruits among the two sisters lissy is the most wiser one and she knows that this fruit which is magical is a mark of sin and goblins are too much of a supernatural people and their fruits should not be taken because lissy is the more wisest and therefore she stays away from it whereas the younger one laura it knows the warning and she pays for one fruit with a lock of her golden hair and once she eats that uh, fruit she becomes immediately addicted to the taste as time goes by she becomes sick and withers away physically and also spiritually so much so that her thoughts and everything is 
is more focused on consuming the fruit. Nothing is superior to, who, to her rather than the fruits. And she searches for the goblin again so that she could get hold of the next day she searches for the goblin again to show so that she could get hold of the fruit. And after much search she reaches the goblin but they reject her because right now she has nothing more to offer them. Not a penny, not even the golden, she cannot afford to lose more hair. So therefore she is not ready to give her hair too. Now Lizzie decides to save Laura. Lizzie being the elder sister decides to save Laura and therefore she goes on an adventure to meet uh, and confront the goblins again. And therefore she confronts the goblins and tries to buy the fruit. Now despite the goblins attempts to force her to eat the fruits, Lizzie refuses. Liz the only agenda for Lizzie is to buy the fruit and give it to uh, Laura, so that the Laura's pain for not getting or the addictive way, you know, when a person who doesn't get drugs becomes so violent, like that Laura was getting more violent and she couldn't have a, uh, have a life or a thought of her own. So Lizzie thought, let me bring the fruit so that my sister uh, would finally get some peace. But she was at the same time not ready to consume the fruit. Whereas the goblins, just like how they lured Laura and made her consume the fruit, they also want to do the same to Lizzie. But Lizzie, being the most wisest and most pure woman, again, if you look at it, pure women, so it's more uh, biblical, refuses. And goblins become aggressive and forces her to consume it. And during that process, you know, uh, she some fr the fruits are smeared on her face because they were trying to you know insert those fruits upon her mouth and she escapes with the fruits smeared on her face. Lizzie rushes back obviously she didn't get any fruit because she was you know trying to you know uh, let's say we cannot say rape actually but at least abused by the goblins. So in order to escape from more abuses she rushes back. So the fruits are smeared on her face so she asks Laura to lick the fruit from her face so that ultimately she, she would get saved. So ultimately Laura consumes it and Laura for the time being has satiated her desire to consume more fruit. With that the poem concludes. With the poet informing the readers that these two sisters Laura and Lizzie each got married and now they have children. They learned their lesson from the goblin market. If you look at it, Lizzie doesn't have to learn any lesson because Lizzie uh, has always, I mean, from the, from the beginning to the end of the poem, Lizzie's uh, look or let's say focus or idea of who the goblins are, are pretty much clear. Whereas Laura has learned her lesson that not to take anything from a stranger and not to wither away from the path of righteousness. So in a way, the two sisters form two different kinds of women. One who lose their way completely and goes towards the sin. Whereas, one, a person, whereas another woman is a stronger woman who is more focused about her path and she becomes more righteous and pure accepting the righteous path of the God. Let's have a more understanding regarding the character of Lizzie. As I said earlier, Lizzie and Laura, they, they represent two different personalities. If you look at Lizzie, she is self-sacrificing virgin, sensible and obviously being the older sister and therefore she also knows better. And she has far more strength and this strength is physical and spiritual. Spiritual in the sense that you are not, the goblins are not able to trick her. At the same time they are not able to physically conquer her too. So therefore she finds a way to return Laura, that is the younger sister to her youth and beauty. So Laura is like a, sorry Lizzie is like a god to Laura. 
and also as a role model. And she appears to be the more prudent of the two, as I said, wisest of the two. Her sacrificial nature is often therefore compared to Christ because she is ready to sacrifice, she is ready to take the plunge to meet the goblins. That's a kind of a sacrifice, like, like just like how Christ is ready to uh, accept all the sins for us, like that Lizzie was ready to sacrifice herself uh, to make Laura better. And also she is able to see beyond the tricks that the goblins are using to seduce Laura. Therefore, you can say her as a perfect character of purity. In a different way, it is a passive kind of heroism as well, a perfect woman. And obviously, she resists the temptations too, not like Eve, completely unlike Eve. Just like you can say Adam, though Adam, uh, over the course of time, at Eden, he consumes the fruit. So you cannot even call Ad Lizzie or compare Lizzie to Adam. It's more suitable to the Christ. And in, in the certain points or lines of the stanza, she has been mentioned as white and gold, which again shows the purity, because obviously these are colors associated with virtue. And she is also called as a lily in a flood and a rock which emphasizes her stubborn resistance, just like a rock. She is stubborn about getting the fruit. She is also stubborn about not succumbing to the, uh, to, the, to the tricks of goblins. And she has also been compared to a beacon because of her steadfast actions. It is more instinctive, just like you know, uh, plucking a bird uh, with a beak. Now, completely antithesis to Lizzie is Laura. She is naive, curious, and that's the reason why she consumes the fruit at the, for the first time. And she's easily tempted by the goblins, which obviously is akin to Eve. She can also be compared to Eve because she has eaten the forbidden fruit. And obviously, she is greedy because she wants more and more. And is also an example of a woman of curiosity. Rosetti at this point compares her first to a swan, you know, look at the transformation, a swan and then that is a living being and suddenly it becomes a flower, then it becomes a branch and finally as a kind of a vessel. Now what is the significance of a vessel? Within the vessel you can mix anything, even bad and the good things together. So vessel only acts as a carrier, it does not contribute substantially to anything at all. So it's more insignificant, as you say. It's more a kind of a receptacle. Whereas Lizzie refers to her as a sort of an elixir. You know, Lizzie is more like a kind of a Lizzie gives life to Laura. And Lizzie feels that Laura can rid herself of the negativity she has been enduring simply by feeding off of Lizzie who conquered the goblin in order to protect her. So in that way, it's a kind of an elixir. That Laura can be a good woman by consuming some goodness from Lizzie. And what is this goodness that is inherent in Lizzie? Is to try to help her elder, sorry, younger sister and trying to sacrifice herself, just like Christ, to get the fruit. So that feature of sacrifice is considered to be a redeeming elixir for Laura. So this is the character sketch of Laura. Moving on, the most important or villainous figure within the poem is the goblin. And who are these goblins, by the way? They are small, a mythical, gnome-like creature with grotesque facial features. They are similar to a leprechaun in mythology. Notorious mischief makers, you know. Leprechaun, I mean, if you have seen uh, some old fil English films, you can see leprechaun where they try to get your attention by, uh, by, by, it's just, just like, you know, giving you a kind of a wish and tricking you. Uh, it's actually uh, not a living being actually, it's, uh, it's only a mythological figure. And they are mischief makers, they are trying to gain your attention, they are trying to, you know, trick you every now and then. So goblins are small, just like dwarf life characters, they are trying to, to trick you. 
So, they are also here Rosetti compares them to vermin like qualities, you know, worm like qualities and it is also compared to a snail. Obviously, you do not try to try to say that I mean no one would consider a snail or a vermin as cute or you know something that you can cuddle. You can call a cat as cute and cuddly, you can call a dog as cute and cuddly, even a rat can be called as a cute and cuddly, but not a vermin, not a snail. They are also called as whisk tailed merchant because they, they have whiskers. Obviously, their attire itself is not particularly pleasant, but at the same time there is something interesting about them. Maybe because they are mythological fair, they maybe because they have facial or norm like characteristics, you know ghost like characteristics. And especially it is the sound that they make that really, really lures people in, it indicates a kind of a devilish sound as being smooth as honey, you know. It is like in you, you, you are, you are, you know, in, in old Malayalam films, they have this Yakshi character who sings songs and lures you. Like that they have this lure, they will just lure you because you, their sounds are smooth as honey. And therefore, Rossetti also compares them to those. That's, that's quite interesting because at once she says this is a mythical norm, devilish character and at the same time she comes up with this completely different uh, words like honey and dove. And dove, if you look at that word, it supplies another Christian imagery, which obviously dove is always, uh, you know, linked to the words purity and goodness. So, you are a little bit confused when you read the poem. So, does Rossetti want the goblins to be good or whether they, whether it is right for Lizzie to call them as evil? Now, we do not know much about that, but this is what Rossetti tries to do, that she creates that visual spectacle for you to understand whether it is good or evil. Moreover, she uses words like leering, cure, sly, you know, coyness are the other words which are used to define goblins and their character. Now, let us look at the literary devices that is implied on the uh, poem. You have alliteration in the in lines like Glen and Goblin. So you already know about alliteration. Alliteration is the uh, repetition of the sounds at the beginning of the words. So Perloin, Purse, etc. These are words that has been often repeated. Then you have Anaphora. It is another kind of repetition, one that is more concerned with the reuse and use of the same words at the beginning of lines, just like you know, the like, like, which starts five of the seven lines of stanzas four, you know, it is again repeated. Then one, this kind of repetition helps creating the feeling of a kind of an accumulation, as if the poet is building up to something or is bringing together lines for a common purpose. So that is what you feel. Since it is 31 stanzas, this is how uh, Rossetti, uh, you, know, uh, you know, focuses on the theme. Then imagery which we have already done with regard to certain lines, let us say, this tailed merchant bade her taste which is mentioning about the goblins, again about smooth as honey, cat first purred from stanza 5 and stanza 8, like two blossoms on one stem talking about the uh, sisters, like two flakes of new fallen so two wands of ivory tipped with gold for awful kings. So these are, these bra brings into play a lot of images. Then obviously what you uh, come across in blank words, it is called enjapment. Here the poet cuts off a line before the natural conclusion of a sentence or phrase. Let us say uh, enjapment means running on lines. Uh, you, re re you write one line and the next and you do not continue. Uh, I mean, uh, especially when you write a sentence, you call it as one sentence. But whereas in poetry, especially when it comes to enjapment, you write, let, let, uh, I mean, I will give you an example. Let us say, my love is like a red, red. The rose might come at the second line. So this is what you call as enjapment. For example, in the poem itself, you have, uh, you know, a transition between ones, two and threes of stanza eight and lines. 6 and 7 of stanza 10. 
you have you can see this kind of an enjambment then you have imageries and metaverse now i have what i've done is that i've extended more about imageries so you have mostly these are emo erotic imagery if you have looked at the first uh, first or the second slide there is this uh, line which says that uh, you know sucking the fruit out of her face it's more erotic it's more sensual it's more lot of sexual connotations are there within the poem so the temptation of the fruit the kiss and the men tempting the women all seem to relate to sexuality and perhaps the loss of virginity you yeah, see you have to understand that when the goblins call for selling fruits you have only two women you don't have any men there what does that suggest and goblins you can call them as no but also as men and at the end goblins are trying to you know uh, abuse lizzy so what meaning does it make it it the meaning that rossetti tries to convey is that there are mean men out there who are trying to grab who are trying to get the attention of these innocent ladies and as good ladies with god fearing ladies you should be really careful of these men that's what crossity tries to do and for that purpose she had made these men as goblins again coming back to the imagery time is another important theme and is mentioned multiple times in the poem you have the words mornings and evenings repeated again and again which shows a sense of urgency to buy the fruit and also shows the theme of temptation the goblin say come buy come buy you know buy it buy it come on buy it and laura takes one of the leftover seeds from the fruit that she ate and tries to plant it that is in the second half what she, laura does is that after consuming the first fruit she doesn't have money or she doesn't have anything to buy the second set of fruits so what she does is that out of despair sadness or out of desperation uh, she had took the leftover seeds of the fruit and tries to plant it and rossetti here presents the image of watering the seed or the plant with her own tears so she is crying and hopelessly hoping that this seed would sprout and give her fruit it also signifies a long passage of time the idea of waiting for a seed to grow is just too much for you so you are waiting 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 at the same time you are undergoing the pain of not getting the fruit it also shows a metaphor for her impatience another thing which has uh, which is considered to be a kind of a sin that you have to be persistent just like jesus christ not only persistent but calm impatience is also a sin then if you look at the lines early in the morning when the first cock crowed his warning this is where uh, the poem starts now cock's crow is here described as a warning now, it creates a sense of tension so i think not in the beginning actually it's in the second uh, you know half where after consuming the fruit she slept and the next morning she rose which is who is uh, which is uh, laura and from the cock's crow itself you know that there is something bad that is going to happen which obviously has a vague biblical reference wherein the bible it is said that the tail of the cock crowing three times when peter denied knowing jesus so it's again a bad omen you know cocking of the crow is a bad omen and then you have another image of silver penny which again has a reference to judas you know 30 pieces of silver so she has taken the silver penny so that she could get uh, the fruit from goblins and which shows again a kind of a treachery where 30 pieces of silver is been taken from uh, taken for to cheat uh, jesus christ so so sting lizzy opening herself up to temptation she allows herself to look for the goblins and listen to their hypnotic tone something that she had up until now avoided so the goblins physical assault of lizzy points towards a metaphor which conveys the loss of innocence or a portrayal of rape so this video is more focusing on the imagery summary and also the character sketch of these characters in the next video i'll explain more 
about <coughs> uh, I'll extend more about the imageries. Thank you.